It is now my distinct pleasure to present a man named Charlie Plum. A few years ago, he wrote a book called I'm No Hero. Well, that's a lie because he is a hero. Charlie is an ex-Navy pilot with 75 combat missions in Vietnam under his belt. If he had to do it all over again, he says, he would have stopped at 74. On his last mission, he was shot down just south of Hanoi, captured by the North Vietnamese and brutally tortured. He spent the next 60 years of his life in a POW camp where he was fed a daily diet of degradation, humiliation, and physical abuse. Charlie looks upon his survival from this ordeal as the triumph of an ordinary man. He was repatriated back to America in 1973 and since then has spoken to over 2,500 groups about the inner strengths in each of us that help us overcome adversity. His message is timely, and though the circumstances are dramatically different, I know you'll find personal meaning in his remarks. While in prison, Charlie distinguished himself among his fellow POWs for his ready smile and his good words. He brought both with him tonight to help us pay honor on this, the traditional observance of Memorial Day. Charlie is no stranger to many in the United family. He's an ardent member of the United Plus, having logged over 100,000 miles on United in the last three years. Rumor has it he's going on the shuttle flight in order to make up that uh, 100,000. Here he is, captain in the U.S. Naval Reserve, a commercial-rated pilot, and a personal friend of many of you in our far-flung audiences with friendships dating back to his days at Annapolis Naval Flight Training and Squadron Duty. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a deep honor for me to present Charlie Plot. The prison cell that I was in in Vietnam was eight feet long and eight feet wide. I could pace three steps one way and then turn around and pace three steps the other. Inside the cell, no books to read, no window to look out, no TV, telephone, radio. I didn't have a pencil or a piece of paper for 2,103 days. <clears throat> I had three steps one way and three steps the other. I don't know what you would have done. I was going stir crazy in that cell. I finally decided, Charlie, you gotta come up with something to do. You gotta go crazy in here. I thought, that's what I'll do. I'll make a little game to play, and I did. I constructed a little deck of playing cards about the size of postage stamps, I tore these cards from 52 little strips of toilet paper. And I can tell you this with authority, it stuffed the shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> Fellow pilots and supporters, I'm proud to be with you. While I don't deserve to call myself a member of your family, I've been accepted as one, and so I will. And I think in some small way, way, we share a lot of similarities. We've been through military training together. I have shipmates and classmates. I have squadron mates in this audience. We've been through rigorous professional flight training together, and we've been through those cold, dark nights flying down to minimums together. And you've served me well on hundreds of thousands of miles, and for that I appreciate it. But something may be in a larger sense which we share. I think my background and yours, we share the courage to stand up for what we think is right, the guts to survive, and the commitment to win. 
Within the audience gathered here, I feel that you represent a large number of parachute packers. Let me explain that to you. My wife and I sat down in a restaurant not so long ago. About two tables over, a guy looked at me and I looked back at him. I didn't recognize this gent. He stood up a few minutes later and he walked over to our table and he looked down at me and he pointed his finger in my face and with a stern look on his, he said, you're plum. <laughs> I looked up and I said, yes, sir, I'm plum. He said, you flew jet fighters in Vietnam. You were on the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. You were shot down, you parachuted in the enemy hands and you spent six years as a prisoner of war. I said, how in the world did you know that? He said, I packed your parachute. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, for this professional public speaker, my chin was down here on my chest. The very best I could do was stagger to my feet, reach out a very grateful hand of thanks. I was speechless, but this guy came up with just the proper words. He grabbed my hand, he pumped my arm, and he said, I guess it worked. <laughs> But yes, sir, indeed it did. And I must tell you, I've said a lot of prayers of thanks for your nimble fingers, but I didn't realize I'd have the opportunity of, of saying thanks in person. He said, were all the panels there? <laughs> well, sir, I must shoot straight with you. Of the 18 panels that were supposed to be in that parachute, I had 15 good ones. Three were torn, but it wasn't your fault. It was mine. I jumped out of that bird at a high rate of speed, close to the ground. That's what tore the panels in the parachute. It wasn't the way you packed it. I said, let me ask you a question. You keep track of all the parachutes you pack? He <laughs> said, no. And I think this is the most important part of the conversation. Maybe it's the most important thing I'll say this evening. He said to me, and I think this deals directly with the reason for our meeting. He said, he said, no, it's enough gratification for me just to know that I have helped somebody out along life's rocky road. I didn't get much sleep that night. I kept thinking about this dude. I kept wondering what he might have looked like in a Navy uniform, a Dixie cup cap and a bib in the back and a bell-bottom trousers. I wondered how many times I might have passed him on board that ship, how many times I might have seen him on Liberty Call, and I didn't say, good morning, how are you? Nothing, because after all, you see, I was a fighter pilot. And he was just a sailor. And how many hours on that long wooden table in the bowels of that ship did he weave the shrouds and fold the silks and do a standard to mediocre job I could have cared less yeah, until one day, my parachute came along, and he packed mine for me. And so the question is this, gang, how's your parachute packing coming along? And who in this crowd is packing your parachute? You see, I think in times of trial, we all need that kind of support group. We all need those folks that step out in front and say yes. I'll help. Well, my parachute was pretty well packed when I was shot down over enemy territory. My physical parachute, my mental parachute, my emotional parachute, my spiritual parachute, pretty well in place. And it all began in a little bitty town in Kansas. Grew up in a, a, a very small town, 325 souls and a couple of Presbyterians. <laughs> I, I love the town. <laughs> And my parachute was packed with my dad and my mom and my big sister and my two little brothers and the coach named Smith. Clancy Smith was a World War I veteran, still had some shrapnel in one leg. And we were to be the last team he would ever coach. The fellow was 65 years old and he was a tough hombre and we didn't have a very good team. And we were down to the very last game and our, our season had, was, was one and seven and we wanted to win that last game just for the coach but we didn't, we lost, and I'll never forget walking back to the locker room, and Coach Smith came up to me, and he put his arm over my sweaty shoulder, and I looked up at him somewhat intimidated, and I said, I'm sorry, Coach, I, I, guess, we're, I guess we're just a bunch of losers. 
and he squeezed my shoulder and he sunk his fingernails into my flesh and he said, son, whether you think this team is a bunch of losers or a bunch of winners, you're right. And Coach Smith came up to me and he put his arm over my sweaty shoulder and I looked up at him somewhat intimidated and I said, I'm sorry, Coach, I, I, guess, we're, I guess we're just a bunch of losers. And he squeezed my shoulder and he sunk his fingernails into my flesh and he said, Son, whether you think this team is a bunch of losers or a bunch of winners, you're right. Whether you think you're a loser or whether you think you're a winner, he said, you're right. When I asked him the next day at school, I said, Coach, I don't understand that. Please explain it to me. He said, Son, I don't want you to come back here in four or five years and tell me the reason you failed in high school and college was because you went to this little bitty grade school. I don't want you coming back here in six or eight or ten years and telling me that the reason that you couldn't get a job was because you weren't educated. I don't want you telling me in 12 or 14 years the reason you failed is because you married this old gal and she turned off bad because he said the difference in success or failure is you. And it's a choice. He said, and we all have the choice. Well, I graduated from that little grade school, graduated top of my class of two. <laughs> the other guy wasn't all that bright. <laughs> Went away to Annapolis, the Naval Academy, where I was held prisoner. <laughs> they, they let me go after four years of that place, but I got my parachute back there, too. Admiral Charles Kirkpatrick, the commandant of midshipmen in those days. The guy had gold, it seemed, from his wrist all the way up to his shoulder, and he used to stand up in front of big pep rallies, and he would clinch his fist, and you could see the veins running his brow, and he would say, you guys can do anything you set your mind to do. You guys can do anything you set your mind to do, became our motto for four years. We didn't know how to lose, and we didn't very often. That four years, the Naval Academy flew Roger Staubach, Joe Bellino, two Heisman Trophy winners. We were the number two and number one team in the nation, and best of all, Navy beat Army four times straight. <laughs> Uncle Charlie was right. We could, in fact, do anything we set our minds to do. I graduated from Annapolis. I didn't graduate top of my class. In fact, well, I graduated in the half of the class that made the top half possible. <laughs> I was proud. Somebody had to do it. It's a dirty job. Away to Pensacola, Florida. And the footsteps of my friend and colleague, F. Lee Bailey, and then Meridian, Mississippi, and Beeville, Texas, and out to San Diego, and learned to fly the F-4B Hanson jet. Once on the Kitty Hawk aircraft carrier, left my bride, my high school sweetheart, and I set off to fight the war. 75 combat missions later, on the 19th of May, another famous date in May, I was hit by a surface-to-air missile. My radar interceptor officer in the back and I started to tumble through the sky. And that big F-4 Phantom jet, that $4 million machine, we kept coming down like a, a greased anvil. We found ourselves upside down, going down at 500 miles an hour, just a screaming fireball headed for the ground. Well, my co-pilot was getting a little concerned. <laughs> you can tell this because he was talking to me in a voice about two octaves higher than normal. <laughs> he said, you want to get out, Trey? Now, wait a minute, we have this extra special problem. Now, the way you normally get out of a jet fighter, as you know, is with an ejection seat. It's like a rocket under your chair. Set off that rocket, it shoots the chair out the top of the airplane. And we were upside down. I had it all figured out. <laughs> you see, I had a little agricultural background from my farming days in Kansas. I determined to eject from that altitude upside down was going to plant us. About six and a half feet, I figured, <laughs> below the level of the rice paddy. I had to turn the airplane upright. I grabbed the stick of was frozen. I lost all my hydraulics. The only control I had left was a manual rudder. I hit that rudder as hard as I could. I said a prayer as loud as I could. The airplane shuddered. It rolled back upright where I ejected. 
My co-pilot ejected, and we came floating down in our parachutes over enemy territory. Ever been in one of those parachutes? Oh, I don't mean the silk and nylon kind. I'm talking about those parachutes of life. I'm talking about those times when your gut is twisted and wrenched with a decision that you have to make. And none of the decisions seem to be quite right. I'm talking about those fender benders, the hangnails, the little bitty things that get to us. Well, the parachute opened. I looked at my co-pilot. He was in good shape. I then bowed my head and I said a prayer. I asked for a little strength from above. I drifted on down to the ground. I was captured immediately, hauled into the prison camp where I was tortured for military information and for political propaganda. And after two days of that, they put me in the cell, the one I described to you from the very beginning. And it was, in fact, eight feet long and eight feet wide and I could in fact face three steps one way and three steps the other and as Mr. Grant suggested to you I was afraid I feared not only for my life but for the lives of my buddies I feared for those who were at home waiting for me, my wife and my family and friends. Well, I was pacing along several hundred miles into that little event, and I heard one day in the far corner the chirping noise of a cricket. Just a little cricket sound over in the corner of the prison cell. I paid no attention at first, yet the longer I listened to the cricket, the more rhythmic it became, and I thought, now, that's a pretty educated little critter. <laughs> Maybe I, I can teach that dude to sing. I walked over to the corner of the prison cell and I found there no cricket at all but a piece of wire. It was about that long. It was coming out a hole at the base of the cell wall and scratching on my concrete floor, making a chirping noise like a cricket. I watched the wire bobbing in and out of there. Let me tell you what was going down. I, I figured the wire had to be connected to an American on the other end, maybe on the other side of the storeroom next to my cell. And I needed to communicate with another American, that was for sure, because by that time in my experience, I was losing track of what was a real memory and what was just a hallucination. And I needed to tug on the wire. But you know what the overriding emotion was? Fear. I was afraid to tug on the wire because I was I was sure that on the other end was going to be another macho fighter pilot who'd probably been stronger than I and who probably wouldn't understand the condition that I saw myself in. You see, at that moment in my life, I was 24 years old. Oh, yes, jet fighter pilot, the guy with the right stuff. But I was bleeding from four open wounds from the torture. I was a graduate of the Naval Academy an officer in the greatest navy in the world. But I had 27 boils on my front side, a bunch more on my back. I was the, the prime of my youth. But I was down to 115 pounds, riding away in a communist prison camp. My sole possession in life, the entire plump estate, was a rag. I had knotted around my waist just to hide my nudity, and I didn't want anybody else, least of all one of my peers, to see me the way I saw myself. Ever uh, had that kind of fear? Yes, we all do sometimes. We're all afraid once in a while to tug on a wire. We're all afraid once in a while to offer to pack that parachute. Well, I finally got the true grit, the guts up to do it. I knelt down in the prison cell and I reached for the wire and I tugged on the little wire three times. And it tugged back <laughs> three times. And I tugged again and it tugged again and finally uh, when I tugged four times it disappeared. Well, I stepped back in the cell wondering what next would happen. The little wire came back about an hour later. On the end of the wire a little note wrapped around. It was made of toilet paper 
just blobs of ashes on this wadded up piece of toilet paper. It said, memorize this code, then eat this note. Mm. I did it. I memorized the code. I ate the note. Then I sneaked it back to the hole in the wall, and I knelt down again, and I started tugging on the little wire. On the other end of the wire was Lieutenant Commander Bob Shoemaker, fighter pilot, astronaut candidate, had been there two years when I got there, and his first words were, how you doing, buddy? On the other end of the wire was Lieutenant Commander Bob Shoemaker, fighter pilot, astronaut candidate, had been there two years when I got there, and his first words were, how you doing, buddy? Ah, oh, that was my cue. I'd been looking for someone to tell my troubles to. I said, I'm doing terrible, buddy. I said, for goodness sakes, my president sent me over here. I get shot down. It's his beautiful little war. Now look who's paying the price. And then some idiot mechanic just put a transistor in that airplane. Something went wrong. It wasn't my fault. And get Congress over here. They're the ones that appropriated all that money. Let them sit in this prison camp because I'm going to rot away and die in here. Help me. He said, you want to know your biggest problem? I thought, you mean I got problems bigger than the ones I can see? He said, it sure sounds like it. He said, it sounds like you're suffering from a fairly common prison disease, and it can kill you if you don't catch it in time. I said, what's the name of this disease? Maybe I know something about it. He said, around here, we call it prison thinking. I said, prison thinking? He said, Roger, you think you are a prisoner. I thought, what kind of nut did he put me next to? <laughs> Guy's in space somewhere. He doesn't know how badly I hurt. But I had to keep communicating. I had to keep validating. I had to keep tugging on the wire. I said, tell me about prison thinking. He said, well, when a guy gets shot down, the very normal, red-blooded American court thing for him to do is start feeling sorry for himself and blaming everybody else. He said, you, you go into the woe is me mode of life, your safety wire there, woe is me, poor mama plums, little boy Charlie, long way from home in a communist prison camp. You get a, get a bushel, bushel of, of, of pity and then just swallow in it. He said, then you start blaming everybody you can think of. Blame your president for sending you over here. Blame the Congress for appropriating the money. Blame your mechanic for putting your airplane together. Blame your mother for giving you birth. He said, the problem with this, of course, is when you start blaming other people for your misfortune, you suddenly give them control over your life. I must admit to you, it took me a long time to validate that principle, and I'm still working on it today. I get here, out here on the highway, I'm driving down the road, minding my own business, doing 55, right on a double nickel. Some idiot comes around me, cuts me off, I hit my horn, I hit my brake, I, I wave my fist, I yell some obscenity, and all day long I'm stirring up all these cholesterols, see, getting ready for a good old heart attack. Or oh, the guy that cut me off, just driving right on down the road, <laughs> doesn't even know my name, and yet he's got control of my life. I said, okay, Shoemaker, you got my attention now. Tell me what the antidote is to this disease. He said, well, the first thing you need to break down the walls of prison thinking is faith. He said, and not just the spiritual faith, of course, you have to believe in something greater than yourself, but you have to have faith in your country and faith in your roots and faith in the United States of America. He said the second thing you need while you're here is commitment. You've got to be committed to a set of standards. You can't be afraid to stand up and tell the world what you think is right. He said the third thing you need is P-R-I-D-E. I said pride, and I looked at my poor, wretched body again, and he said, that's right, pride. You've got to be proud of yourself. You've got to believe you're a good enough person. You can overcome the problems, and one of these days, march out of here, a proud American with your head held high. I said, okay, I think I've got those things, faith, commitment, pride, and I found during those next six years, those three factors were more important than the rice we ate or the water we drank. The shoemaker sure packed my parachute that day. 
He gave me those panels which allowed me to overcome the adversity of prison life. But he certainly wasn't the only one to do it. And if we hadn't been involved in a fellowship of prisoners of war, I don't think I'd be standing here talking to you today. And one of the greatest parachute packers of all in that camp was an enlisted man. Now most of us, you know, as you know, were officers and pilots. Had very few enlisted in the prison camps in Vietnam. And yet one guy was there. He was a Navy sailor. How did a Navy sailor get into a prison camp in a ground war in Asia? He fell off his ship. And he got washed ashore. <laughs> So I explain that to your commanding officer. <laughs> Seaman Douglas Hegel from Clark, South Dakota. 17 years young and he enlisted in the Navy and he sent him off to a place he couldn't even pronounce. And late one night he fell off the end of his ship. He floated around for six hours, finally washed ashore, captured and put into a prison camp 10,000 miles away from home in a communist country he couldn't pronounce where he had to live with 200 macho fighter pilots which may have been the worst part. <laughs> oh, young Hegel could take a joke. He was kind of a Radar O'Reilly kind of a kid. What a parachute packer. We used to have these contests, you see. We would tug on the wire, tap on the wall, and our secret code, we'd say, who's the oldest in the prison camp? Or who's been here the longest? Or who's got the most children back home? One time we had what we call the high, fast, low, slow contest to determine what pilot had jumped out of his airplane highest and fastest, who'd gone out lowest and slowest. Well, high fast was won by some Air Force jock that punched out of his F-105 at 52,000 feet, a thousand miles an hour. Low slow contest was won by Seaman Hegel. <laughs> Twelve feet at 15 knots, right there. Some three years into my stay, the North Vietnamese were getting a lot of flack from the world press at their treatment of prisoners and their torture techniques. And so they wanted to release some guys early as proof of their goodwill. And most of us were given an opportunity to go home early. Well, as you know, we had a code called the Code of Conduct. It's not a military regulation. It's only a code. You can't be court-martialed for it. And yet we were all brothers in there, and so we elected not to accept early release because that was the code. Oh, there were a couple of guys who did. Two officers decided that they would go home and accept early release. Our senior man selected Seaman Hegdall, that he should go first. Why? Well, first of all, Hegdal was the youngest person there and an enlisted man. But more important than that, Hegdal had developed a photographic memory in that prison camp. He'd gone through the list of 200 prisoners, memorized first, middle, last name all the way through. He went back through, memorized our identifiers or social security numbers. And after that, he memorized our next of kin. And then each hometown of each of the relatives. And finally, I'm not kidding you, he memorized the telephone numbers of each of the relatives of each of the 200 of us prisoners of war. Well, the three fellows came back, Hegdal, the legal one, and the two officers who decided to go their own. Now, what would you suspect? Here's a 19-year-old lad, a sailor with two years back pay in his pocket, hadn't seen a girl in two years, and he's free on the streets of San Diego. Oh, remember, he's a parachute packer. Well, while the two officers decided to go on some great vacation of their own with all of their back pay, here's what Hegdal did. He started to travel. He went west coast to east. He spent a lot of his own time and a lot of his own money. He went north to south. He went through each of the hometowns he'd memorized. He dialed each of the telephone numbers he'd memorized. He spoke to each of the relatives he'd memorized and told them that their prisoner was alive. Got any Hegdals in this association? 
I would submit that you do by about 96%. Got any Hegdels in this association? I would submit that you do by about 96%. Got any Hegdels in AFA and IAM and all the other groups that you've seen on these screens? You see, the point is, Doug Hegdel wasn't looking for a great kudo or accolade. No achievement medals given here, just out there on the front line to serve. Well, we wondered for six years how we'd find out we were going home. Finally, they told us. We launched out of there on a big old Air Force C-141. What a lump in my throat. What a sight that was flag on the side of that airplane, wow. First stop, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. I made a telephone call I've been wanting to make for six years to my wife, my high school sweetheart, back in Kansas. And she'd gone. So I called my dad and I said, Dad, what has happened to my wife? And he said, come on home, son, and we'll talk about that face to face. I said, now, Dad, it's gonna take me three days to get back to Connors Tell me now, we, uh, what has happened? My father could not do it. He passed the telephone to my mother. I'll never forget her words. She said, son, I'd give 10 years of my life if I didn't have to tell you this. But your wife filed for divorce three months ago. She's engaged to another man. I came back to the Kansas City area. You'd be interested in all the good advice I was getting. The legal beagles were saying, we're going to sue her and her boyfriend. We've got the papers all written out, which they did. Just sign right here. We're going to put them in jail. We're going to take them for all they're worth. That'll fix them. Psychiatrists and psychologists had some pretty good ideas, too. They were saying, Charlie, you've got to get angry about this. You've got to get mad. You've got to get all this stuff out of your system. After all, if anybody has the right to be bitter, you have the right to be bitter. Imagine that. Somebody telling me, I have the right to be bitter. That's like me telling you, you have the right to have diarrhea. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, now wait a minute. I fully admit I am a Rip Van Winkle awakened after six years. I really don't know exactly what's going on here. But I have been through six years of the University of Hanoi. When I got a degree in hard knocks, and if there's one single thing I've validated in that communist prison camp, it's this. Coach Smith was right. He was right. It's, it's my choice. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, I can choose to be bitter. And maybe that's the easiest choice. I can choose to sue everybody I can think of. I can choose to be really, really angry. I can choose to crawl over in the corner and atrophy and die. And I know I can do that. I have the capability. I've seen men do it. Oh, have another choice. Option number two. Pick up the pieces of this great jigsaw puzzle. Press on with my life with the confidence and the commitment that it's going to take. And live every day to the fullest, regardless of the price. And that's what I've done. And that's what the other guys have done too. And you know who they are. You see them in the papers and you fly with them all the time. We, we had a reunion last August in Austin, Texas, of prisoners of war from Vietnam. There are only 592 of us. We have a U.S. Senator from Alabama, a U.S. Congressman from Arizona. We have state legislators all over the country. We have preachers and teachers and doctors and lawyers and professional pilots and public speakers. And the doctors tell us we're healthier today mentally and physically than the guys who didn't get shot down. Shoemaker, the guy on the end of the wire, he's a Navy Admiral today on the West Coast. Doug Hegdorf, the kid that fell off the ship, has a master's degree today, still, still teaching school. My ex-wife went ahead and married the fellow she was engaged to. I bounced around the country as a bachelor for a lot of years, ran into a gal from Memphis three years ago, married her, we became parents. 18 months ago. <laughs> when
What's the, what's the connection, gang? You'll never be prisoners of war. You'll never, you'll never have to pace three steps one direction and then turn around and pace three steps the other. You'll never have to learn all those codes. But don't you see the similarity? Each of us has a choice. We have the choice to stand up and be counted for what we think is right. We have the choice to give of ourselves and pack those parachutes. We have a choice to be a part of the team. Oh, speaking of the team, the two officers that came back with... Incidentally, Seaman Hegdall is our hero today. The two officers that came back and broke the code, they're not a part of our organization. In fact, we never even speak to them. Several fellows wanted to court-martial these guys, but we didn't really think that was quite appropriate. And yet, well, let me borrow a, a line from F. Lee Bailey a page from his book when he told you the other night you get to be 60 years old and you look back on your life and you're not counting dollars and you're not counting flight time you're counting the parachutes that you've packed six years is a long time to pace three steps one direction and three steps the other and I wouldn't wish it on anyone here and yet I would tell you it's probably the most valuable six years of my life Amazing what a little adversity can teach a person. And yet it gives a, it gives a man a pause to, to think. How will I survive? What are the techniques of survival? What are the properties of a winner? Well, may I suggest to you that we will survive and we will win. And it won't be easy. No, there's no bed of roses here. We'll have some mountains to climb and some parachutes to pack. We'll have to tug on some wires along the way. And we'll have to apply the faith, the commitment, and the personal pride. And that's for sure. But we will win because we are family. Thank you. Nobody fell asleep through that one, I can tell you. Thank you, Charlie Plum, for that inspiring talk. And from what I've seen of the people of United over the past month or so, I'd say you were talking to the greatest gathering of parachute packers ever assembled under ten roofs.